Uh, good evening, friends. Uh, I should thank you all for joining this uh, arrangement from a small group of nephrologists from uh, Tirunelveli to Tukurin, Kanyakumari. We call ourselves TTKNG, and we try to have uh, our meetings, uh, not every month, but we try to have because amidst uh, hectic schedules from uh, inform, peculiar case, and so many things going on. And uh, usually it is personal meet we have here. And uh, uh, this topic I thought will interest many. And also considering that uh, amongst us, we may not have enough expertise to really answer all our uh, queries. Um, so um, that's the reason uh, you know, I wanted to enlarge this uh, discussion panelists and I wanted uh, more people to join. And I think this has created some interest amongst the uh, uh, audience and the group. Many were asking for uh, recordings and things like that. So I hope uh, we are able to do justice. Uh, and uh, uh, first, uh, I wanted uh, Professor Muthu Sidhvidi, our teacher, uh, to join us as a guest of honor. And uh, he was uh, uh, ready, but uh, last minute, you know, um, due to his uh, personal reasons, and uh, I mean, he was not very well. So he has sent a small uh, uh, clipping, uh, which was recorded an hour ago. Uh, you know, I wanted uh, um, simply uh, some words of wisdom from him. Uh, it is always, uh, we have had uh, a lot of things uh, from him and uh, areas like genetics, which he keeps on reading. And I remember him presenting uh, books in genetics only to us and uh, our uh, children who visit him. Uh, so let's go with his uh, uh, blessings. Uh, good evening. Good evening, everybody. So today we are going to discuss. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Okay. Today. Yeah, good evening. Today we are going to discuss a very important aspect of nephrology, which, as you know, owes a lot to advances in genetics. We all know that um, each one of us has in every cell in our body, 3 billion, 3,000 million base pairs of DNA, I mean, uh, of nucleotides, which constitute the entire genome in a cell. So this is a large number of DNA, which is organized to, into about 20,000 genes. The rest are all non-coding DNA. This is a basic information which we need to remember. The enormously long DNA chain, which only has about 20,000 uh, genes and the rest are non-coding DNA. So these uh, nucleotides, the order in which they're situated in the DNA influence the protein synthesis in the cells and influence the way every action, every uh, physiological biochemical procedure in the body takes place. For example, protein synthesis, for example, the, uh, the production of uh, cytokines, the activity of lymphocytes, uh, B lymphocytes, their ability to make um, immunoglobulins, the T lymphocytes, the cytotoxic T cells, the red T cell, all these, the activity is influenced by genetic factors. That is why uh, transplantation is such, a, such an uncertain way because we are still far away from fully understanding what is going on in the cell. So this is uh, just to give you an idea of the complexity of the issue. Coming to practical things, we are uh, all aware that an important group of glomerulonephritis like FSGS, many of them, or quite a few of them, are genetically mediated. And therefore, medicines like corticosteroids may not have any role in their management. There is a group of uh, patients with FSGS who will not respond to 
immunosuppression. So we need to find out which one of them is. And therefore, uh, genetic uh, workup is essential in such patients, especially in young FSGS patients. Similarly, ADPKD, of course, is well known. Even though genetic workup may not play a role, but it still it may tell us about how fast the disease is going to progress and so on. So there again, it is important, particularly as a research procedure in uh, ADPKD patients. More important of all, most important of all is the role of genetics in transplantation, in choosing a donor. In, we are all aware how um, certain antigens like ABO blood group and uh, HLA antigen groups and non-HLA antigen groups all play a role in uh, transplantation. Whether the graft is accepted or not is determined largely by the concordance between the genes or the, the genes coding for the uh, ABO, HLA and other uh, minor transplantation antigens between the donor and the recipient. And now we, our technology has advanced. We are able to know exactly which, uh, against which HLA specificity, a given donor has, a given recipient has antibodies. So that will actually determine whether the graft will be accepted or not. So our technology called Luminex platform, such technologies have improved to a point where it is extremely sensitive in detecting antibody to uh, a given HLA antigen. Even individual HLA antigens and their antibodies can now be detected confidently and that uh, teeters estimated whether they're increasing, decreasing, etc. Our problem now is to understand how best we can make use of the advances in technology in, uh, ben in, in bringing benefit to a given donor recipient pair. How are we going to do it? How, which is the best way? Because sometimes these uh, tests are a little too sensitive for clinical use. Which one of them is clinically important? Which one of them is important but not, but it's something which can be suppressed by our effective immunosuppressive drugs all that is to be discussed. And I'm sure uh, today's discussion will largely focus on the transplantation uh, workup and how the HLA, anti-HLA antibody, the, uh, our ability to do the Luminex assay of detecting HLA antibodies, all that will be brought out in today's meeting. Yeah. I'm not very well today. That's ah, why I yeah. can't take part. Okay. Right. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Right. So Thank we you. just heard uh, Professor Mutsidhiri talking. I don't know some of us heard. Fine. So, uh, you know, he was uh, giving his uh, uh, impressions on genetics in uh, renal disease and transplant. Uh, now, I think we'll start. So we, I'll just uh, very, very quickly uh, introduce the panelists. We have Raja Ramachandran from PGI Chandigarh. Uh, he is too well known to all of us, especially his work on membranous nephropathy and glomerular disease. And uh, he has willingly joined us today. Let's hear from him. Then we have uh, uh, Dr. Sendil Kumar, uh, who is uh, the consultant scientific affairs uh, officer, uh, genetist attached to Medgenome. So he'll be, you know, uh, uh, helping to uh, helping us to understand the the technicalities of doing genetic testing and you know the advantages and disadvantages of different types and so on. So he has joined us, and we have uh, uh, Sukanya Govindan, pediatric nephrologist. Uh, generally, pediatric nephrologists are uh, more conversant with uh, genetics than us. So I I thought uh, she should be able to help us learn. And uh, the, first, we'll start with an index case uh, presented by Dr. Subhashree. Um, uh, she's a brilliant student of Edwin, and uh, she's now uh, assistant professor in Thutukudi Medical College. She has uh, come to Trinalveli to join us. 
uh, i think uh, i'll uh, just uh, make her uh, present the case shortly then we'll go on to the discussion uh, a very good evening to all uh, before i start i would like to declare that i'm no expert and i'm here to learn from you all tonight so i will i'll be presenting about a case scenario given to me so the history goes like this we have a 39 year old gentleman who is a third born child in his family out of a second degree consanguineous marriage he works as an optician he denies history of alcohol intake or smoking and he presented to us with complaints of bilateral uh, edema and breathlessness over a period of which was and over a period of 6 months so regarding his timeline of events um from his medical records the history dates back to 2005 when he had presented with complaints of nagging pain in his right shoulder also with decreased sensation in his right upper limb but there was no significant motor deficit the evaluation of which showed he had an mri spine done which revealed a syringo hydromelia uh, hydromelia at c4 to c7 level and the brain showed mild hydrocephalus with arnal chiori malformation type 1 he was treated with pregabalin for a few weeks uh, which he later discontinued he was advised to undergo a foramen magnum decompression which was yeah so regarding his timeline of events it starts from 2005 when he had history of nagging pain in the right shoulder with decreased sensation in the right upper limb he did not have any uh, motor deficit the mri spine showed a syringo hydromelia at c4 to c7 level and the brain showed mild hydrocephalus with arnold cherry malformation type 1 so he was treated with pregabalin for a few few weeks which he discontinued later he was also advised to undergo a foramen magnum decompression which he did not resort to so the course was uneventful till 2017 when he presented with abdominal pain elsewhere so for the evaluation of abdominal pain he underwent an ultrasound the report showed a query medullary nephrocalcinosis the urine analysis showed proteinuria of 3 plus with calcium oxalate crystals creatinine was 1.6 calcium 11.3 potassium was normal uh, his 25 hydroxy vitamin d was 10.1 magnesium was normal ipth was little on the lower side uh, abg showed a ph of 7.5 and a bicarb 32 which translates to metabolic alkalosis probably the treating physician wanted to rule out a sarcoid he also had a report showing his ace levels which were normal In 2020, his renal failure worsened to creatinine 3.6. The ultrasound this time again showed a medullary NC, but he resorted to Siddha medications only to present to us later in July 2022 with complaints of volume overload, orthopnea, acute pulmonary edema. The ultrasound now showing contracted kidneys on either side with medullary NC creat raising up to 11, bicarb 16. Hence, he was initiated on hemodialysis. with a history of native medications in the past the analysis of heavy metals was done which turned out to be inconclusive regarding his family there is history of cholelithiasis and thrombotic stroke among various family members of query significance there is history of renal calculus in one of his uncles as well so this is the pedigree chart so here you see uh, multiple family members having cva and cholelithiasis one of his sibling also having gallstone and this is our patient moving on to clinical examination he moderately built height was 164 weight 64 he's pale he has got edema bp is 120 80 system examination showed an rs with bilateral repetitions otherwise the uh, cardiovascular per abdomen and cns did not show any abnorm significant abnormality with normal ent and ophthal examination as well moving on to the investigations urine showed albuminuria 2 plus there was no rbc no deposits hemoglobin was 10.2 creatinine 11 and his echocardiography showed a global lv hypokinesia with a heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction in gra grade 3 pulmonary hypertension so the first step in identifying genetic disorder is to consider it so this patient who was a young male presenting with uh, ckd initiated on dialysis and being considered for transplant we had to go ahead with a genetic analysis which showed a mutation in the kcnj1 gene which results in barter's type 2 the kind of mutation the classification it fell under was a likely pathogenic mutation now one another condition which every nephrologist will strive to rule out is a hyperoxaluria in patients who are presenting with nephrocalcinosis so to our surprise there was a mutation in the foga1 gene as well which results in primary hyperoxaluria type 3 but the mutation was the classification that it fell under was of uncertain significance 
So here we have a 39 year old gentleman who has ne medullary nephrocalcinosis. Uh, he was on native medications, progressed to renal failure with not much of significant extra renal involvement, initiated on dialysis with a significant history of CVA, cholelithiasis, and renal stones. So the diagnosis in this patient is a chronic kidney disease of stage five dialysis dependent, the etiology being a chronic tubular interstitial disease. The genetic analysis shows he has got a mutation in the KCNJ1 gene with a likely pathogenic mutation presenting as Bartos type two and another mutation of uncertain significance, which would uh, which which uh, translates into a primary hyperoxaluria type 3. So regarding nephrocalcinosis, we know it's generalized deposition of calcium phosphate and oxalate. It could be either intratubular or interstitial. Now, whether this nephrocalcinosis is harmful or not depends on the magnitude of the deposition and also the problem that causes it. Either is it an ongoing one or is a transient one plays a big role. Now, there are three categories of NC. One is molecular where there is just increased intracellular calcium in the, in the kidneys without crystal formation. This actually means there is hypercalcemia presenting with renal dysfunction. The other category is microscopic, where the crystals are seen only in the light microscopy, but not radiologically. And macroscopic category is when the crystals are visible even radiologically and with ultrasound. So medullary nephrocalcinosis, these are clusters of calcification around renal pyramid, most commonly seen in metabolic conditions uh, secondary to several monogenic diseases. Knowing the involved genes will shed light on the underlying pathophysiological mechanisms and its management. Now, I'd like to emphasize there is a classification of ultrasonography with regards to medullary nephrocalcinosis, where there are, there are five grades to start with. So there's grade zero where the ultrasonography is normal. So it means there's an underlying disorder, but it is not seen in the ultrasonography. And as the hyperechoic rim starts increasing from faint to hyper intense, it, uh, the grades come uh, become one to two, one to three. And when there's a stone formation in the tip of the pyramid, it is going to be grade four. So there are n number of uh, inherited causes of nephrocalcinosis. The genes involved, the ones that can cause distal RTA, Barter syndrome, the Claudin genes. It doesn't stop there. It goes on to, it can cause uh, cystinuria, dense disease, and finally primary hyperoxaluria type 1 and type 2. So this pictorial representation of what's happening at the different segments of the, of the tubules, which can result in neurogenic disorders of nephrocalcinosis. So in the proximal tubule, it can be a dense disease. It could be a hereditary hypophosphate request for hypercalciuria or it could be a cystinuria or hereditary hyperuricosuria. In the m cell, the well-known daughters, and you also have Claudin gene mutation, which results in familial hypercalciuric hypomagnesemia, and the set of genes that can cause distal RTA in the collecting tubule. So what is the commonest etiology of nephrocalcinosis in our population? There's a paper in, um, uh, in our country, which uh, was uh, published by Arvind Bagga. It involves nephrocalcinosis patients in looked into around 40 patients and found the commonest cause was the distal RT accounting for 50%, but he was not able to find out a cause in around 12.5% of patients. But the interesting observation that was made was during a period of two to two and a half years follow-up, the GFR actually fell from 82 to 70 mils per minute. A similar paper from South India, a study done at JAPMA, this included patients of around 54 in number, and again, this will actually top the list. But the, with regards to GFR, this paper actually said the EGFR from 59 to 77. So there's a pictorial, the graph that shows that the distal RTA had around 33 percentage of patients, primary hyperoxaluria around, six, around 60, and barters accounting to 13 percent. So how do you diagnose etiology of medullary nephrocalcinosis when you encounter one? This is a proposed algorithm for global nephrocalcinosis. So you run the event test to look for creatinine and calcium and oxalate, blood for the arterial blood gas analysis, creatinine and platelet. Proposed condition that has to be ruled out is hyperoxaluria, followed by if there is going to be a metabolic alkalosis with high levels of calcium, or chloride, and potassium, it means the patient has got barters. On the other hand, the patient has a metabolic acidosis with hyperchloremia. It is either Lewis syndrome when the patient has a negative urinary anion gap or distal RTA when there is a positive urinary anion gap. Now, this medullary or global NC can also be associated with a normal acid-base balance. In that condition, we look into 
whether the patient has got high levels of calcium both in the blood and in the urine. Please we run for pH and vitamin D levels and find whether the patient has got an excessive calcium carbonate ingestion or vitamin D intoxication or is it due to a hyperparathyroidism state. If it's going to be a patient having a high level of urine calcium with normal serum calcium, look for magnesium levels. If it is less, it means a patient has got a Claudin mutation. If it's normal, look for low molecular weight proteinuria. Again, if it's going to be normal, it means the patient has got an idiopathic hypercalciuria or patient has been treated with a frusamide or steroids. In case of increased low molecular weight proteinuria, it means the patient has got dense disease. Now, moving on to the first mutation that the patient had, so I'm not going into the details of genetics. We all know there are five types of barters depending on the channel that is being affected. And since barter, uh, barter syndrome can have genes that are present in the distal tune, there can be an overlap between gentlemen's and barters. So the gene that was involved in our patient was KCNJ1 gene, which is responsible for coding the renal outer medullary potassium channel. But what is all the more fascinating is the phenotypic spectrum of Barter syndrome. So it's not like there's a hypokalemia with metabolic alkalosis, polyuria. It means the patient is going to have Barter's. The manifestation depends on the underlying genetic disorder. So for example, a patient with a type 2 Barter's is less likely to present with hypokalemia, can all the more present with a transient hyperkalemia. So it, it, it is so much so important that the progression of CKD, in fact, depends on the uh, genetic mutation, whether the patient has got a type 1 or a type 4 Barter syndrome. Now, these associated symptoms such as deafness, nephrogenic DI, polyhydramnios also are greatly impacted by the underlying genetic mutation. Regarding the main tests that are used for the diagnosis of Barter syndrome, the foremost one is a clinical diagnosis, where it is very important to have a clinical suspicion. But we do know that a clinical criteria will not offer us a certain diagnosis. The second one is a diuretic test where they perform it by using a thiazide diuretic and based on the change of fractional excretion of chloride, we differentiated whether it is the Barter's or a Gittleman syndrome. But the flip side is that it can be life-threatening for the patient because of the profound volume depletion that the patient can have. There is something called a microvesicle study. It's a non-invasive test where we analyze the urine to find out whether there is abnormal channel that is going to be cause of the underlying genetic disorder because all these channels are basically proteins. But again, this is not in clinical use routinely and it needs specialized personnel to, uh, to run these tests. So finally, the genetic diagnosis is the most rel reliable diagnostic technique, but again, is complicated by large rearrangements. This is a slide which tells you about the uh, treatment of barters in general. Uh, we have the potassium supplements, pyrinolactone, amyloride, ACE inhibitors, and ARBs. So these individual treatments have their own limitations and clinical controversies. Moving on to the uh, aspect of renal transplant in patients with barters, we were able to find uh, case reports of patients with barters. One such is here. So this patient was diagnosed with a classical barter at three months of age, underwent a transplant at 16 years of age. The underlying genetic mutation was a CLCNKB gene. The cause of renal failure in this patient was a secondary focal segmented glomerulosclerosis. And by the time this paper got published, the, paper, the patient had completed three years of post-transplant course with complete disappearance of barters without recurrence of FSGS. Now, this is another fascinating paper which I came across, which discusses about the option of a preemptive nephrectomy followed by a transplant for barters. So they described two cases of barters being diagnosed very at a very earlier age. One patient had undergone a re, uh, right nef native nephrectomy at 17 years of age, followed by a live-related renal transplantation and did quite well. The second patient was diagnosed at around three months of age. He, was in, he actually was subjected to bilateral nephrectomy. There was a PD catheter placed to optimize fluid and electrolyte and, along with the nutritional status. And the paper actually reads that, that there was a normalization of fluids and electrolyte balance for the first time of, in his life. So this patient later on had a disease donor renal transplantation and did well. There's another paper uh, uh, talking about the live-related renal transplantation. So there's a renal dysfunction four years post uh, after diagnosis. And after transplantation, the creatinine settled down to 1.7. Now, there was a, a, 
history history of kolil itihas in, in multiple uh, 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 family members in this particular patient so what i kind of found was surprisingly several patients with bartas had reported kolil itihas at an younger age it seems and this was because the alkalinization of bile favored presentation of calcium carbonate the dehydration also added upon added to the uh, bile viscosity moving on to the second mutation that is primary hyperoxaluria we know there are three types uh, one two and three and the enzymes that are responsible for it so how do we work up a patient with primary hyperoxaluria both with normal renal function or a patient with a chronic kidney disease we run for the levels of urine oxalate urine glycolate and l glycerate in patients with ckd we also look for plasma oxalate levels so if it's going to be two times the normal limit we go on to perform a genetic testing and based on the mutation that is involved we classify bartas as type 1 2 and 3 if there is no provision for a genetic testing the other way of diagnosing primary hyperoxaluria is by performing a liver biopsy and looking for the agt and grh pr enzyme activities if both the enzymes are normal normally active then it means the patient has got an oxalate disorder of undetermined type if the agt levels activity is less it is type 1 and if the grh pr activity is less it's type 2 so this is about the uh, evidence of hyperoxaluria in uh, in the blood and in urine so it is advised that a plasma oxalate level has to be reserved for patients with stage 3b ckd why because the Uh, till stage 3a the plasma oxalate levels are somehow maintained within normal limits so values more than 50 micromoles per liter is suggest to a primary oxaluria and this is a reference table which tells about what is a normal cut off of the different metabolites that are being looked into the urine so why are we talking about ph3 today is that when the paper came first in 2013 in any gym the trigger to read if you notice in type 3 they have not Uh, mentioned about transplantation or they have kind of documented it as it is not required because no reported case of renal failure has been uh, found to date but just two years later hop et al he published a paper in jason 2015 and he uh, documented the first patient with primary hyperoxaluria type 3 developing esrb at 8 years of age he ran the genetic analysis and told there was a non conservative missense variant which was likely to be pathogenic so 7 years later the last uh, uh, cohort of 95 patients this paper was published in kidney international 2021 it uh, describes about 90 patients in open countries and that primary hyperoxaluria type 3 alone accounted for 7.3 percentage of patients with total primary hyperoxaluria registered so far and notice the number of 95 patients have been more than 18 years of age and of these 95 patients these actually had different stages of ckd and two percentage of them had actually ckd stage 4 to stage 5 so what started as nothing in 2021 this age we know that ph3 type uh, three can present ckd stage 4 or stage 5 regarding the therapeutics we have traditional methods of using pyridoxine straight so we are moving towards the uh, substrate reduction therapy the well known lumasiran and nidosiran etc uh, this is the treatment algorithm proposed for primary hyperoxaluria so from here i would like to have uh, sukanya ma'am take over the discussion ma'am um. Thank yeah, you. She's uh, yeah, Suganya. As you get ready, see the the reason for presenting this case and calling for a discussion is so this patient uh, came with a end stage renal disease to me with all those previous histories, but uh, with somebody having severe renal failure, it is difficult to evaluate and you know diagnose Bartos or uh, oxalosis. So genetic test is the one which is you know going to be definitive, and we did it. and uh, barters of course is not going to be a hindrance for transplant but uh, oxalosis uh, however remote the chance be uh, you know we would uh, tread uh, doing it so with this uh, uh, current report you know we were not able to proceed although it says uh, type 3 so we wanted to be sure and that's why we have taken this case 
and i need uh, um, impressions from the other panelists and the audience so when yeah yeah so you go on from here let's see Uh, thank you very much, sir. So uh, at the outset, when sir discussed this patient with me a couple of weeks ago, uh, I had a few first thoughts come to my mind. So the goals of genetic testing in this patient is somewhat once. This is a patient in summary with nephrocalcinosis uh, attaining CKD5 by the fourth decade of life. He was born out of a consanguineous marriage. And uh, the goals in such patient who's going for a transplant would be to assess the recurrence by testing the etiology and assess the recurrence of such an etiology occurring in his transplanted mm -hmm. kidney. And also if you're looking for a living related donor transplant, then to assess the suitability of a donor and also risk of disease in that particular donor. Uh, mm -hmm. So with this in mind, um, comparing the two mutations that you've had in this patient. So one is the uh, Bartas type two, and the other one is the uh, primary hyperoxidia type three. Uh, so coming to Bartos, if you see this patient has a homozygous mutation on for what is a autosomal recessive disease. So it sort of fits in there itself. And this patient also has nephrocalcinosis, which is quite well described in patients with Bartos. And if you closely watch in his 2017, when he first presented with renal dysfunction, um, anybody who has renal dysfunction obviously would have a degree of metabolic acidosis. But in this patient, he still has some degree of metabolic alkalosis with CKD2 and 3. That is sort of what caught my eye in this presentation. And also, it's not like Bartos can't develop ESRD. They do develop, there are many case reports and there are obvious reasons. Some of them have uh, coexistent FSGS or as a, um, you know, um, or as a, a long-term uh, uh, problem, um, tubular problem overflowing onto your glomerulus or the well-known association of persistent hypokalemia with chronic interstitial nephropathy. Or some of these uh, children in a younger age for uh, managing their fluid and electrolytes uh, are exposed to NSAIDs. But this patient has not been exposed to that. So he's been a, a patient who's never been diagnosed with Bartos before or been treated for one. Uh, this patient also had a renal dysfunction of th at 35 years of age, quite a delayed uh, presentation. Uh, the one thing it is that there's been no decompensatory episodes to account for AKI or for anything that would contribute to a later development of CKD5 in a patient with Bartos. We do uh, see a cohort of children who uh, do not either respond to therapy or who present to us late having multiple episodes of AKI because of fluid and electrolyte um, and disturbances coming very dehydrated and progressively over multiple episodes of AKI develop uh, chronic kidney disease and move on uh, to stage five. So that sort of presentation has also not been in this patient, but rest of the all sort of fits in with the presentation of CKD5 with the background of having a homozygous mutation for Bartus. Coming on to the primary hyperoxylia type three, so Bashri discussed, if you see the um, uh, cohort from Oxal uh, Europe, uh, although uh, type three is now more and more recognized, majority of these patients have very early onset of urological events like UTIs, like uh, ca uh, calcium or stone passage and uh, hematuria or something like that. So till date from the amount of information that we have about PH3, most of them have urological events, which is not, which is sort of missing in this patient. That is one thing, and this patient obviously has only one copy of that uh, uh, gene, uh, uh, PH3 gene. And also, um, a CKD5, as uh, uh, Subhashri said, CKD5 can definitely be plausible in this patient, although the amount or the number of patients or the proportion of patients, even among PH3 mutation, is going to be quite less. So how um, uh, rare this situation is, and even rare is CKD5 in this condition. With that in mind, um, if this patient would be transplanted even, would there be an early recurrence in this patient? So that also needs to be considered when uh, assessing him for transplant. And um, if we are considering PH3 as a strong uh, uh, I mean, um, possibility in this patient and possibly refuse transplant for him at this stage, uh, we should also be looking at any evidence of systemic oxalosis if genetics is not going to guide us in that way. Uh, definitely, if oxalosis is the reason for CKD5 at this stage when he's on dialysis, there should be some evidence of systemic oxalosis as well. So an eye screen or a bone marrow or a cardiac screen with MRI to look for oxalate load in the cardiac muscle 
angel. Uh, and if there is any stone passage or a stone could be retrieved from his kidneys, any stone analysis, and also plasma oxalate are some of the things that could be doable in this patient, I felt. Um, moving on. Um, so if all these possible uh, things are being explored and you're still unable to conclusively rule out a primary hyperoxaluria, of course, as I said, strong evidence of systemic oxalosis. If it's there, I would definitely hesitate to transplant this patient. And also the other um, um, opportunity would be to sort of screen the family, do imaging in them, uh, either by an ultrasound or CT to look for any stones. And if anybody has a positive uh, history of any of these events, then to probably test them for also these uh, two genes and then take a combined decision along with the family, uh, take them into confidence. And if there's not much of an evidence for PH3, go ahead in good, uh, in good faith. And that's what would my uh, sort of uh, this thing for this patient would be. And uh, uh, with this, we welcome all the other discussions and uh, guests to put their uh, views as well here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sukanya. Uh, Dr. Raja, can you have your views on this? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Subhashri and uh, Sukanya for the comprehensive review. And uh, Subhashri did a very nice presentation. So I would restrict my comments to only primary hyperoxaluria because I feel that, you know, barter is no more relevant at this point of time in this given index case. It is uh, relevant only for theoretical discussions. With respect to any genetic uh, defect, we usually three, see three aspects. Uh, one is the clinical presentation, whether it is consistent with the disease. Two, the genetics and its results. Third is the biology or the proteins. So if, if I have to break each one of them, the first one I would pick is the clinical presentation. So primary hyperoxaluria is uh, renal stone disease. So, you know, you can have nephrocalcinosis, but nephrocalcinosis is not the dominant presentation. So it's mainly stone disease, urology presentation, onset at a very young age. So I believe like, you know, there is a clinical inconsistency to primary hyperoxaluria one. With respect to second is second picking up, it would be the genetic testing. So in the genetic testing part, we have, uh, I, I, I suspect it was a variant of unknown significance, right? It was VUS. So uh, in, in case of VUS, you know, it means that it has not been reported earlier. But if you believe that, you know, this is there is a strong association between the clinical presentation and the gene which is showing the VUS, what you can do is do an in silico modeling that we usually do in silico modeling is to see whether, you know, what happens to the genetic defect with respect to the proteins. So, if, you know, if, you, they, if it shows that, you know, the protein is going to be abnormal with in silico modeling, then you can say that this is probably pathological you know, this, this could be pathological. However, I believe there is an inconsistency in the inheritance also in this case. So clinical presentation, I think there is inconsistency and it is significant. Genetics, also I believe there is an inconsistency and whether significant or not, we could do an in silico modeling, which is feasible. Third one is, uh, you know, the proteins or the biology. So the best way to do is plasma oxalate. But, uh, you know, we know that it is not freely available. At least I haven't been able to easily get it done till now. I remember only one case where it was sent outside India. So, uh, uh, in short of uh, doing a biology, what we do is we screen for other organs. You know, the common organs, uh, you know, once the kidneys are saturated, we believe that, you know, the bone marrow and the eyes would take up the eyes in the sense that fundus would take up the, the, the calcium oxalate precipitates. So, I think if the fundus is okay and the bone marrow is not showing anything, I think we have a clinical presentation, genetics, and the protein part, which is inconsistent with primary hyperoxaluria type 3. And I would proceed with transplant without hesitancy in this patient. I know there could be, you know, differences, but I would like to hear the comments of others. Uh, that's good news for me. But uh, should we be testing the parents? Will that uh, throw any more light? Uh, presence of uh, these genes so I think, there were some suggestions yeah so i would uh, look more into the you know the protein if you could if you could see that identify 
if there is elevated oxalate levels or C for other organs uh, to show the deposition of calcium rather than screening the patient because you're going to do new tests, you're going to have new findings, you know, and you do not know where you have to go from there. So I, I would restrict myself to the index case. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, confirm. Yeah. yeah. So in the presentation, uh, I could see the presence of hypercalcemia. Yes. So what is the reason for hypercalcemia in this patient? Yeah. I mean, I find from the previous initiation, they have chased uh, sarcoidosis, doing ACE levels and all that. Uh, but after coming to us, we haven't noted uh, uh, so hypercalcemia. One so thing, we uh, in this background yeah. of uh, nephrocalcinosis with uh, hypercalcemia, uh, and the phosphorus is also a bit high initially when the renal failure was not very severe. Am I right, sir? Ah, yes, yes, yes. yes sir. So, in this case, 125 dihydroxy vitamin D level was not done. Only 25 hydroxy vitamin D level was done. So, in patients with uh, idiopathic hypercalciuria, they may have a high 125 dihydroxy vitamin D levels, which will increase both calcium as well as phosphorus and can have hypercalciuria with uh, renal failure also. So, I am not very sure. Forget about this uh, genetic testing. Uh, I had a case with mild renal failure due to idiopathy hypercalciuria, wherein they will have hypercalcemia, nephrocalcinosis, hyperphosphatemia, suppressed PTH, and um, high 125 dihydrox vitamin D levels. So, I don't know whether that will come into a differential diagnosis in this patient. Then uh, uh, coming to diagnosis of uh, oxalosis in a case of end-stage renal disease, uh, what would be the investigation uh, approach, you know, which is, uh, I mean, uh, uh, foolproof or, you know, should we be doing, uh, trying to do everything or uh, now is there a role for uh, liver biopsy these days? Sir, what was the plasma oxalate level, sir, for that patient? Well, a plasma oxalate, uh, you know, we couldn't get it done. Uh, even Raja was telling he has... Sir, it is available, sir. It is available in SRL lab. They are doing it for around uh, 8,000 rupees. We do for all the patients. Uh, yeah. uh, Easily available, sir. SRL Granbaxi is doing it for 8,000 rupees. I have been doing it for many of my patients. Yeah, yeah. So if your oxalate level, plasma oxalate is normal, then you can proceed with the renal transplant. Oh, both are but normal. if it is elevated, if it is elevated, then we cannot say whether it is because of renal failure or is it because of the mm. primary epoxaluria. So normal oxalate, I had a case of a type 2 primary hyperoxaluria with ESRD when the plasma oxalate level was normal. So a normal level doesn't rule out, uh, whereas a range of 80 to 90 favors. Uh, usually what is told is in renal failure per se, the oxalate excretion comes down. So they say that even if you don't have primary hyperoxaluria, you can have an elevated oxalate level. So it is it, it can give false positive results, but giving a false negative result is pretty rare. That is my view. One more thing is, uh, one more thing is, the, sometimes patients can have severe cytopenias. I had a patient with oxalosis who had severe thrombocytopenia, where bone marrow, bone marrow showed uh, uh, bone marrow oxalosis. The oxalate level. Sorry, any cytopenia, sir, for this patient? Uh, uh, what is that? Thrombocytopenia uh, no. or uh, leukopenia? No, no. Uh, you know, I, he never had throat his uh, presence. Okay. Uh, what will be the final advice Hello? for this case? Oxalate serum, uh, blood oxalate level, fine. So if it comes uh, um, normal, then we are safe. High, then we can't be sure. Uh, is that right? Yes. Can I yes, take sir. it that way? Yes, sir. Hello, sir. Hello, but, uh, yes. Hello? Yeah, Chandra. Chandra yeah, sir. Yeah, Chandra. Yeah, sir. 
still i go with uh, dr rajan's comment like the whatsoever there is no urological complaint at all presenting only as nephrocalcinosis is very very rare right so i think i start with uh, serum oxalate level definitely if it is with this uh, presentation with this genetic testing with uh, vus if it is low i think i rule out oxalosis as the cause only thing is okay. if you are going to evaluate the donor donor also suppose the parents or somebody they also show this uh, vus then it is a dilemma Yeah. To donate. So, when we are evaluating to make a diagnosis in a case of CKD is fine. That's cool. But for a transplant, it's a different ball game. <laughs> Even with smallest doubt, doubt, you know, you can't go. Away. So I'll check the serum uh, oxalate level. And about this parents uh, um, genetic testing, any comments on that? Uh, will it, uh, I think it is it, help it is in any way? Yeah, it is reported as heterozygous, right? It could be heterozygous or compound heterozygous. Still, I I still think if it is homozygous, then we we have to consider. But it is heterozygous. I think definitely need a parental uh, genetic studies. If it shows VUS, I think I there is also a lot of things in oncology where uh, VUS uh, applied in oncology, but they don't uh, change the management. Whatever they just follow the. Same clinical protocol. I think we have to follow the same thing. And Dr. Raja, yeah, I have yeah. a comment to make. So, uh, plasma oxalate level uh, is challenging. I think that's why you know you have only one lab doing it, and you know others haven't caught up with them. So, we have to be very careful whether the methodologies of the lab and how well are they doing, because there can be because even before one of the lab that was mentioned, there was another lab which was doing it, and there were. Uh, reports which was not very trustworthy not this lab but so then people stopped uh, doing it and it was sent abroad so what i would do is despite sending a plasma oxalate level we should also make sure you end up working with get a fundus examination on a bone marrow to be doubly sure like you know we had one comment which says that the plasma oxalate level was low with eskd despite being primary oxaluria you know those kind of situations are cannot happen in a normal time unless you know testing is not uh, up to the state of the art so i would still continue to work him up do a bone marrow examination fundus examination and uh, clinical and the genetics part are not very consistent with uh, primary or hyperoxaluria yeah. like fundus exam had been done okay see, see, then uh, any comments is... from uh, yes hasan I like to add see if the plasma oxalate level is there then there won't be any systemic oxalosis it should be more than 45 to have a systemic oxalosis maybe the uh, the test is wrong okay then uh, uh, dr sail kumar from medgeno what is your take on this Yes, sir. Sir, as far as uh, variant of uncertain significance variance is concerned, I am in alignment with Dr. Raja. We need to see the protein function actually. Where exactly this uh, mutation is happening? Whether it is curtailing the uh, protein function, impact of the variant we need to see. What we call is a, a termination or missense variant. If it is a termination or truncation variant, what we call nonsense variant, means it will completely curtail the protein function. so that will be of more physiological importance but sometimes if there a variant is a missense variant it just slightly changes the amino acid only may not be completely affect the physiology of the protein so we need to see the impact of the variant that is one aspect and the segregation analysis uh, also may be helpful sir it, it may be helpful in uh, understanding the significance of the mutations Uh, means uh, if you do in the parents suppose if it is an autosomal dominant disorder if you do in the parents if, they, if it is inherited from the healthy individuals or is uh, other affected uh, uh, family members uh, asymptomatic individuals then um, it may not be clinically significant sir suppose if you are finding the, the mutation only in the affected individuals and it is not segregated from the parents it may assumes some clinical significance because 
during the embryonic development also some dna error is possible de novo sporadic event we call so that way it will attain a significance so segregation analysis will be helpful to understand the further understand the significance of this variant by looking at the, whether it is inherited from the parents whether it is inherited from the affected individuals uh, or not so uh, checking in the parents and other unaffected family members would be helpful sir looking at the segregation analysis in situation like this when you have to test more members yes uh, sir you are from genome can i ask that could you do that for a very low cost so that is a more of a business question i have very little say on this <laughs> functioning in the technical side but i will put this case across over to business team sir so uh, doctor uh, bala uh, you not have to do the whole thing you can just do a sanger sequencing for the uh, uh, for the gene only that yes. itself it yes, is required yes, so it it is it won't be very expensive considering and that, that uh, yes sir that specific mutation alone can be checked instead of undergoing again the whole exome sequencing or the panel the specific mutation alone can be checked sir in the family members particularly in the parents and other hello yes sir ah uh, yeah uh, i think uh, we'll move on to the next case sir. Dr. Uh, Balan, there is some uh, comments around uh, Dr. Balan and uh, Dr. Baljinder. They have some comment to me, so they are raising their hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, uh, Karthi, unmute uh, them. Okay. Unmute all of them. Okay. Thanks Who very much, uh, Raja. Nice to see you. We have spoken on Twitter quite yeah, often. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, what I will suggest you, I don't have much experience in this disease except one patient and. Uh, I should tell you, I am in Toronto, so I have access to a lot of tests. The patient which was presented to us was a oxalate kidney stone and ended up having a primary oxalosis. It was made on the diagnosis, actually on blood level and kidney biopsy. He ended up on dialysis, and we actually ended up doing kidney transplant, kidney and liver transplant combined. And he is, I think, by about five years post transplant, and doing quite well. Genetic studies, um, we actually tried to do, and it confused us quite a bit, um, despite being having a genetic counseling. So I generally tend not to pursue in, in this situation, and I think that's the thinking in our area also. Uh, forget about the genetic study, and I will go along with Dr. Uh, Raja Raman Chandran that look at the eyes, look at the bone marrow. Those are some beautiful clues you can get it. Uh, so my suggestion to you will be uh, pursuing genetic study may not be helpful, especially in the family. I'm not sure what you do, but uh, consider, uh, I, I didn't get the full history I came to today. If, if he is requiring transplantation, I don't know whether you guys have done liver biopsy on him or not, but I will, in our patient, I think he did very well with combined kidney liver transplantation. Bala, yes. my, Bala, I have a small comment. You know, yes, in this sir. scenario, a simple urine analysis showing a monohydrate crystals, dumbbell-shaped crystals, will easily give some clue to primary hyperoxylvia. I don't know whether the presenter has done urine analysis for crystals. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it was done many times, not looking for this, but there wasn't uh, a clue like that. No, no, but the sir. I mean, uh, maybe we we'll look for it. What is plan for what is plan for this patient from your end? Transplant, transplant. See the whole sir. The whole Agreed. issue started because we are trying to transplant him, and the barter's part we thought is, is quite safe. But this, uh, uh, even though it is type three, suggestion of type three <laughs> oxalosis, we are scared. So that's why we are trying to ask people discuss more. And you know a foolproof method to go on with transplant. Yes. Now, from the discussion so far, I take it that I should uh, uh, do a bone marrow, which I haven't done, and do a blood oxalate level, subject to, of course, the reliability of the test, as uh, Raja said. Uh, then uh, about the testing of the um, relatives. I mean, is that very essential? And uh, that is the final word. Who is going to tell me? So that I can chase them also. I think if you don't have any. Sendil, Sendil. 
Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, if you don't have any clue from the patient, I guess you should stop there. I think you should not uh, do I agree. it. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Because you will, you you will enter into a territory where there is un, there is so much of uncertainty. Like you know, yeah, I wouldn't do it. If you're, I absolutely of, agree with you, Raja. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now uh, I think uh, we'll as we uh, discuss, Dr. Radha, you can uh, share your screen and go on to the. Uh, there are some some more uh, problem cases with the FSGS and other things which are all getting queued for uh, transplant. So whether we can get any clue from genetics, whether uh, they are more prone for recurrence or things like that. So I thought we'll take them. Sure. Then any other uh, comments on this? There were some recent hands. Edwin, Edwin, Karthik, is uh, Dr. Edwin's mic unmuted? Yes, good. Uh, good evening, good evening, sir. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah, yes, Edwin. See, when uh, I was yeah, working at Madras Medical, uh, when I was working at Madras Medical College, Dr. RVK gave me on big file where he had communicated with a person called Dr. Christopher Danpure in London, who was specializing in doing this plasma oxalate. Unfortunately, we were not able to send samples those times to do a plasma oxalate. I am reminded of the words of our teacher, Dr. MSP, who used to say. A test that is rarely done is rarely right. <laughs> and in, in somebody who has got renal failure and 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 somebody somebody's got renal failure, plasma oxalate levels will definitely be high. So it is not going to help you. The other thing that we used to do when we were at Madras Medical College was to do a nephrectomy and send the specimen to CMC pathology department where they used to do what is known as a Sheenman scoring. This was published by the late Dr. Anand Date and his team in Nephron in 1994. Calcium oxalate normally gets deposited even in all patients with CKD. However, the Sheenman scoring, there is a particular formula for that. If that particular formula is used and if the score is more than 90, that is very suggestive of primary hyperoxaluria. Now that we have got laparoscopic techniques, a small wedge biopsy from the diseased kidney would certainly sort out this problem. With a lot of confirmation. Uh, 